So continuing my series on the Fast and Furious cars from the early movies, today I'm talking about Brian O'Connor's Eclipse. Why did we pick an Eclipse? Easy, but not so easy. When Universal hired me to consult the production, I was tasked with recommending and sourcing the cars that we would use. Among the top cars I wanted for this movie included cars like the Acura NSX, the Z32 300ZX, the Subaru Impreza, the WRX was not yet available in the United States back in early 2000 when we were casting for cars. Nor was the 350Z, it wasn't even talked about. Neither was the Mitsubishi Evo, same with the E46 M3. Of course, I wanted a Mitsubishi 3000 GT VR4, which were available back then, but they were too expensive for our budget. So I tried to find even just a regular Mitsubishi front wheel drive 3000. But the only one I could find to show to the production team was a convertible with a low rider paint job. The production hated it because it was gonna to be too complex to replicate and then just didn't fit with the other cars so that was a video kicked out that story is coming up right after the break have you ever googled your name if you have you were probably shocked to see some of your personal information floating around for the whole world to see Every once in a while, I Google myself just for fun. I'm always surprised what kind of things are floating around the internet. It's just creepy that these companies have this information on me. So this is what they do. These data brokers are making money hand over fist by selling your info to robocallers, spammers, and in some cases, much worse. This is why I'm talking about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers who are exposing your information and then submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to, but they make it super hard to do that. So let Aura handle all of it for you. Now you can get off of all of those lists. You can try Aura free for two weeks using my link here below, aura.com slash Craig. Aura does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats that you can't even see. It's really easy to set up so you don't have to bother downloading several different apps just to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft, insurance, and even more. You get everything at one affordable price. So let Aura do all the hard work of keeping you safe online so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. And of course I wanted the best JDM cars in the world. But like I said, it was a low budget movie. How low budget? $25 million. Let me put that in perspective. In the year 2000, a walk and talk movie like when Harry met Sally, that kind of movie would cost $25 million. And while I wanted to import an Evo 5 or a 6 or get a hold of an NSX, they were just too expensive to buy one car, let alone buy the, the, the extra cars that we had to have for the stunts and that kind of stuff. Because for, remember, every car that that we chose we had to buy three or four cars because we needed stunt cars and backup cars to the hero cars so that left us with choices like the 240sx the acura integra the mitsubishi eclipse toyota mr2 which i really wanted this sw20 mr2 but we could not find one that they'd like so universal asked me to have friday show and tells on the back lot on universal yes universal studios california they asked me to contact everyone i knew who had import tuner cars that might fit into this movie this of course was before Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and MySpace was pretty much just a music website only. So we had to do it the old way, not by Pony Express, but we just had to get on the phone. So every Friday for a month or two, I met with the production team at Universal's back lot where we did a show and tell. On one Friday, we would show them a local Integras. On another Friday, we would show them some 240SXs. I presented this one, my buddy Non Fujita with his freaking crazy 240SX. I really wanted that car in the movie. He didn't want to rent it to us and it was too expensive to copy that car for stunts and all that kind of stuff that was out but that would have changed in history that car was absolutely i mean the guy still has the car rj devere and i placed calls to everyone we knew who had cool import cars including some euros we looked at everything vw golfs and all that kind of stuff audi a4s so not only we were handicapped by our budget a lot of people just didn't show up for the audition why not? There were times I call people and invite them, but they didn't believe this little movie, which was then called Redline, was going to go anywhere. The budget was the, really the biggest obstacle to get these cars. And you have to understand, a car movie with multiple crashes, flipping cars and cars getting shot up and get blown up and burned, machine guns and all that kind of stuff, cannot be made for only $25 million. That was the leading impediment. 
In one of those show and tells, the director spotted John Lapid's Mitsubishi Eclipse, which at the time was a very nice Mercedes Silver. Now, John honestly was a little reluctant to rent his car to Universal because basically he just got it done and it was fantastic. So after a little cajoling, he gave them one request. Please, not green. <laughs> Anything but green. And so <laughs> then the next time you saw the car, it I'm was like, green. Holy smokes, it's I think, green. Did I call you and tell you it was green? No, I saw it at the at the, uh, the, the shop. <laughs> but of course, John's Eclipse was already pretty customized. He had uh, a Robocar body kit. That body kit was pretty closely styled to the Blitz body kit, so it had the big, nice opening in the front. Rob Cohen really liked that big mouth front bumper. He wanted that for the, all the cars. For a lack of a better description, it fit kind of the ricey images that he seemed to be looking for. Anyway, John's car was perfect for us. It had some shiny bits under the hood, and since it wasn't super modified, it probably would not break down on set, but it looked the part, and we took it. John's Eclipse was an RS. It used the Dodge 420A naturally aspirated four banger, making about 145 horsepower in stock trim, about about 115 at the wheels. And despite what was said on screen, it was not turbocharged. Most of you know that already. But while it had a nitrous kit, it was not an operational kit. It was there just for looks. We were going to need a total of seven Mitsubishi Eclipses for this film. Why? John's Eclipse was designated Hero One or the Brian's principal. As such, his car had to have working gauges, a functioning audio video system, and lots of other things inside in the car, including switches that turned on, things like fog lights and neon lights. So they looked very cool, right? So that was the Hero One car. Because Universal didn't have the budget to replicate every interior detail, the decision was made to tint the windows of all the rest of the Eclipse to make sure that people couldn't see that the cars were basically empty. In order to duplicate the A-pillar gauges, they made Xerox copies of the gauge faces, cut them out, and then I glued them onto a, a vacuum form copy of the gauge pod. <laughs> That was funny to watch. There were other differences that separated the backup cars and the stunt cars. The stunt cars were not lowered like the Hero One because the stunt cars have to move to and from set on a trailer multiple times. So getting a lowered car on a trailer is already a pain in the ass. But you lower the car, it gets even worse. And second, while the body kit on the Hero car was bonded, the other cars just got their body kit screwed on for the same reason we didn't lower the cars. So that's why when you look at the cars in different scenes, you know, at Dodger Stadium and then when they're racing, the car looks a little different. The production team also asked us to make another change. John's car already had 19 inch ADR wheels, which were very expensive and it looked really cool and it filled up that wheel gap, but to buy 10 sets of that stuff was gonna cost us too much money and we just have to dumb it down. We have to take those wheels off and get them cheaper wheels and smaller wheels, which made the wheel gap even worse. So that's why he didn't have the ADR wheels on the car in the movie and he put them back on after the movie. So to get the wheels for these cars, I called my buddy James Chen who was running the company called Axis, and Axis had a wheel called the 7. The Axis 7 wheels was a decent price. What I didn't know at the time that, that there was only 500 sets of that wheel that were ever made. So once they were sold, Axis never produced those wheels again, and this is why we had the shortage today. Today, companies like uh, Lenso were recently making them for a while. As of this writing, I believe that they stopped making these wheels altogether, and those were the one-piece wheels, but I still see the three pieces floating around on used markets and that kind of stuff. Still the wrong wheel, but if you want to do it, that's your thing, but it, it, just know that you're getting the wrong wheel. So once we settled on taking John's Eclipse, Eddie Paul's team started to build the other Eclipses. As I said, we had seven Eclipses total and they had to get to work on those cars. Each one was done a little bit differently. John's Hero One was painted separate from the other cars because they would take good care with that car. Each car was built differently. Obviously, a car that is going to be blown up does not need a working stereo system or fancy seats or working gauges or any of that kind of stuff. So what we did is we tinted the windows very dark on those cars so that you could not see that it was missing most of its interior, including the door panels, the seats, the dash, the steering wheel, all, all this, the, rear, the back seat, all, it's all gone. Watch the 4K DVD and you'll see that. For those backup cars, you might see some quick glances. We made the Xerox copies of the gauge faces and glued them onto the vacuum Ford A-pillar potter, like I said earlier. So go watch the movie again, especially slow motion. They have explosion seeing, and you can see that there's nothing inside the car, so you can tell it's a different car. Other shortcuts were taken. For example, 
when during the paint jobs of the cars, the color that they were aiming for is a Kawasaki green. Normally when you paint a car, you add a coat of two of clear for UV protection and to protect the paint underneath and give it some shine. For the backup cars, the clear was mixed in with the paint. So it changed everything a little bit. So secondly, when you watch the movie, you'll notice the bright green seems to be, have some kind of orange tint. That's because the camera crews were using a warming filter that you put over the lens. And the idea was to portray Los Angeles as being hot, hazy, and smoggy. And I think they pulled that off. But unfortunately, today people who are trying to paint match some of the cars, like Letty's car, it's very difficult without an actual paint code. Some of those paint cars are lost forever because some of the people have died already and some people didn't keep the records and some things weren't shared. Here's the actual model list for John's Eclipse as it was presented to the Universal. John Lapid's uh, Eclipse was an RS. Just remember that the stunt cars and backup cars did not have most of these items. As an RS, it had the stock two liter 420A rated about 145 horsepower, had an engine cold air intake with a polished piping kit and a K&M breather, a hot shot header, ported throttle volley, probably made about, about 150 horsepower at the crank and maybe about 115 or 110 at the wheels. It also had an HKS Super Dragger gasback exhaust system, a nitrous fogger system only installed for the movie. Although the movie portrayed it, it was a three-stage nitrous system. You don't need a three-stage nitrous system on a car that's making 120 horsepower. On this little engine with a fogger system, you can expect to get maybe 40 to 50 horsepower or as much as 75 horsepower for maybe two to three seconds before they blow the engine or maybe even a little more, but I'm not gonna be the guinea pig. So just know that I was bull <laughs> so. Exterior, like I said, the Robocar body kit, which was basically copy of the Blitz body kit. That's a whole other story. With the custom carbon fiber splitter down the bottom, custom fiberglass wiper covers, custom GT style roof scoop, which was useless. APR two level semi custom CT-2 style sport a wing with six inch extensions at the end, ABR carbon fiber side racing mirrors, a rear quarter panel, a shaved antenna, and a D2 Technic custom gas cap. Everybody was looking for that for the years. They also shaved the keyholes and they installed 1997 Eclipse headlights. Tires and wheels, like I said, John had 19 inch ADR wheels because it was a cool looking wheel and it closed the wheel gap, but Universal chose to go with the Axis 7 wheels and knock it down to 18 inch one piece wheels for, for cost. The tires were a Toyo T01 Proxus, measuring 235, 35, 18, I think I was. Okay, the interior, everybody knows it already had Sparco seats in there. He did some dash work with carbon fiber trim here and there. Uh, he made a custom passenger airbag panel for video gauges. You've probably seen that. He had made a custom carbon fiber panel for the VDO 333-936 tachometer and fuel gauge and a center carbon fiber console customized to accommodate temp and volt meters. Of course, he had a Sparco steering wheel, Sparco harnesses, Folia Tech gas brake clutch pedals, and a polished Folia Tech shift knob. That's basically it. Then we get to the audio. It's the Alpine CVA 1005 CD DVD, two eight inch subs from Sony. He took the back seat out. We also used Sony mids and separates. Front and rear carbon fiber trimmed A pillars and B pillars. A custom six point roll cage that was color matched. I want to talk about the, the Eclipse's big scene. First off, the first race. Everybody remembers that. That got everybody going, going on. So honestly, no way in hell would any of those other cars would come close to the RX-7. It was making double the horsepower of all the other cars in the race. And they, all the cars were front wheel drive. So there's that. We're going to talk about the danger to mandible thing, which still and angry as me. That line was never written into the script. I don't know where they got that from, but I knew that they were going to use nitrous during that particular scene, and they wanted some kind of chaos going on while Brian is driving to distract him, right? And at the end of the race, Brian's card needed still to be, be functional because he's gonna be running from the cops in a few seconds, right? You couldn't come up with a scene where the engine blows up. How do you drive up when your engine's blown up? You can't do it. So, so what I came up was this. I suggested this, that they install nitrous pressure gauges on the bottles. So if you know anything about nitrous systems, if you have a bottle, the bottle has to have the right temperature to give it the right pressure to send the nitrous into the engine. So all those gauges have, you know, a white section, you know, green, yellow, and then red. Any idiot knows if you see a gauge going into the red, you know that's bad. I don't even see your grandmother. She knows it's going in the red, that's, that's, that's bad, right? <laughs> so I said, why don't you do this? As he's going down the race, right, and he's shifting, and then he's driving, all of a sudden, 
we see the gauges keep going higher and higher and higher and higher and then maybe the nitrous lines can split and pop and start flying around like a, a loose fire hose, right? The nitrous is coming out of that bottle of minus 125 degrees C, which means it's super freezing. So if you hit, if that thing is going around the windshield, it's gonna fog up the windshield. So here you have driving like a car like this, and trying to grab the hose and trying to clear the windshield from the ice and all that kind of and flogging enough. Perfect distraction, but not fatal and not terminal for the engine. Perfect setup brilliant I thought <laughs> and I had to explain this to like three or four people and they were like they're looking at me like I was reading Chinese algebra <laughs> so they weren't buying him man really like one of the guys who was talking about this it would be tied with the script he said you know I see sparks and fire here sparks and fire so what we're gonna do is we're going to put uh, uh, these diamond, um, um, this, this, the floor plan's going to come out and we see sparks and fire. <laughs> what? Just kidding. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, maybe it won't be that bad when I see it in the theater. It was worse. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's what I read for, for and the, the dan danger to manifold bull I said to them at the same time, all you can see is like, like you see the RPMs falling off and you're going slower and slower and slower. And then you see red, red temperatures going up, 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 up. Everybody, why did you put danger to manifold? Anyway, technical advisor, you just advise. They don't always take your advice. <laughs> I was talking to, oh, I think it was Creighton Bellinger, one of the script writers after, I actually showed him a magazine ad for diamond plate floor mats. I tell him they're used for floor mats, like like old white guys, you know, well, Corvettes or pick em trucks and all that kind of stuff. Most tuner guys didn't do that here in the West Coast. You go east of uh, Phoenix and down in the south, you'd see guys with Cavaliers and Sunfires with those diamond plate in their cars, as their tuner cars. Uh, they're trying to turn their cars into Japanese cars. No JDM car was using diamond plate floor mats that I ever saw it, but whatever. Can't watch the kids all the time. And of course, my main argument about the floor pan was falling out is that first, they don't really use that as a floor pan for sake. Number two, where is Dominic Toretto gonna put his feet when he jumps in Brian's Eclipse when he's being chased for the cops? What is he, Fred Flintstone stuff? What are we doing here? <laughs> What the? Oh my God, it was, it was bad on the first one. I saw the movie like three or four times before even the audience saw it, but I only saw it in pieces. I never saw a one thing put together totally, except for the pre-screen for the people who rented the cars out, like everybody who rented a car to Universal for this movie. We got to see a mostly done version of the movie and most of that stuff was in there and i even have a discussion with rob cohen he said don't worry man this movie is not made for car people it's for teenagers middle america people in kansas oklahoma your friends won't see any of these movies it's not the kind of movie they would watch also wrong <laughs> and the rest is history <laughs> 20 years later we're still talking about this movie and people overseas are just hanging on, on to every word So what happened to these cars after the movie? Well, they went to a storage facility in Santa Clarita Valley near where the old Thatcher Glass factory used to reside. In early 2002, Universal hired me back again to go check the condition of the cars because they were getting ready to start the sequel. I had heard nothing about that until that moment. So here's what happened. Stunt two and stunt three were in decent condition, and so we put those cars on a trailer and then sent them down to the Miami Picture Car Warehouse. These cars would be used only in one scene, the, the warehouse scramble scene. Um, when I got down to um, Miami and set up my desk, I decided to change the body kits to Bomex kits. Then we painted one bright blue, and the other one was painted candy apple red. The blue one got driven by Paul Walker for this driving school training. After this movie, the cars were shipped back to Ted Mosier's warehouse in Los Angeles. At some point, these cars got sold at auction uh, and eventually found their way to collectors or even uh, movie car museums. I don't have the dates or the prices for what they sold for, but they got spread around all over the country. John Lapid's Eclipse got sold to George Barris for $50,000. 
who immediately funkified the car. When he was done with it, it looked like a Tijuana tax cab. The worst part was that George Barris was claiming that he built the car, a practice he's been done many times before, and at this time, he found himself as the object of a cease and desist by Universal Protections. And that was not pleasant for him. He tried to do something with my Supras as well. That's another story which I told him in, an, in another video. The hero car, John's car, eventually ended up at Hollywood Star Cars in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. It still sits there today, now wearing the 19-inch ADR wheels that John put back on after he got his car back. The car is falling into disrepair. It was in good condition, though. This car could, could command a real premium. Think six figures, $250,000 wouldn't be out of the range. My friend Arian in the Netherlands, who also owns my Supra and other cars, he has the Hero 2 car, and I saw it in October of 22. It is still a mess with all the George Barris crap inside because he got his hands on that car, too. But otherwise, it's intact. Number three, the Desert Museum holds the Explosion car and they still have it and they offered it to Gabriel I think for some crazy amount of money. Number four, Rusty's Cars Museum in Jackson, Tennessee owns the Stunt 3 car. Uh, number five on the list, Stunt 2 is owned by Gabriel Tremblay in Tampa, Florida. The last two cars, the six and the seven, the Mick Rig and the Buck were allegedly at one point welded together to make one full car and the car is now in the hands of Tampa Car Garage. I haven't seen it. I don't think I've even seen pictures of the cars. Confirmed that yesterday. The cars from the first two movies are fetching high bids at auction. From what I'm seeing over the last five years, cars from the later movies beyond Tokyo Drift are not commanding similar premiums. Why not? And I had a couple of conversations with other people, other collectors. It seems to be because most of the cars are donated by Dodge or they're yet another iteration of a 68, 69, or 7 Dodge Charger. So when someone says, I have a Toretto Charger for sale, I have to wonder, which one is Dom's Charger? He seems to have them stashed in every country and each one is a little different. So which one are we talking about? It's diluted and nobody gives a anymore. The Chargers, we do see they're usually crashed or abandoned after one scene, if that. In the later movies, other cars are loaned to the production and thus they never go to auction. The Eclipse is one of the most popular cars for replica hobbyists. I know at least of 75 Eclipse replicas around the world. Now, if you didn't know, John Lapp had passed away a couple of years ago, but his legacy will live on for decades. My favorite memory of John is the day of the Hollywood premiere. We got to put our cars on the center stage for the after party, and it was a surreal experience. We got to hang around with the stars and the production team and all that kind of stuff, and it was just a fun, fun, fun day, and I'm glad we had the experience. For If you want to get into building replicas, the Eclipse is a great car to build. It's gonna cost you quite a bit of money and you're gonna to have to search the world for parts or find people to reproduce the parts, which is a lot of people are starting to do that right now. So look around, find the parts before you buy the car if you're gonna do that. And if you do, good luck and uh, don't get yourself in debt. Remember, it's supposed to be fun. Thanks for watching everybody. I'll see you next time.